Welcome to Andrew Womack Recorded Live, a weekly podcast featuring Andrew's latest live teaching sessions, along with his other classic teachings through the years. And now, here's Andrew. Hallelujah. How many of you, this is the first Healing Is Here conference that you have attended? Could I see your hand? Wow, that's amazing. I guess the others came to previous conferences, got their healing and didn't come back. (laughs) I remember one time with uh, Carly and um, Daniel, they were up ministering. And I think by noon, the first day, we had had like a thousand people stand and say that they had received their healing. I mean, it's powerful and you're going to have a great time. It's, it's going to be really special this week. And so thank you for coming and being a part of it. What I want to do in this first session may sound like it's things that, well, everybody knows this, but the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It doesn't say that faith comes by having heard. Faith comes by hearing. And I tell you, when I deal with anything physical, I don't just sit there and take what I know and just stand on. I'll go back to the scriptures and I'll start studying the same scriptures that I studied 50 years ago that produced healing in me. And I'll go back through and I'll make sure that it's all current. I am constantly going back over things that God has shown me. So what I want to accomplish today, this morning, is to lay a foundation for everybody else and all the things that they're going to be saying. Because to me, the first step in receiving healing is understanding that it is God's will for every single person to be healed every single time. God has already done his part. And if you waver on this, if you believe that God can heal, but you aren't sure that he is going to heal, that's what I was saying in the very beginning. He's already done his part. Jesus is seated at the Father's right hand. Jesus isn't healing people today. And somebody might be disappointed, like, well, man, I came for my healing. He did it 2,000 years ago. The power is already released. The Holy Spirit is here. And he wants to manifest what he's already done. It's a done deal. But we have to receive. And, you know, people are complicated. People, we're just complicated. There's people that have things that affect them. I was just with James Brown this last week, you know, the CBS broadcaster that does the Super Bowl. And he was talking about when he was a little kid, he was reading a book about being a doctor. He wanted to be a doctor. And somebody came by and said, did you know that that's not for kids like you? I don't know if they were talking about his poverty or the color of his skin or whatever, but they said, this isn't for kids like you. That won't work. And he just said something died on the inside of him. And see, things like this, there's things that affect us. And it's what's in us that hinders us from receiving from God. It's never God. God wants every single person, every single person in here to manifest your healing during this conference. Because as far as he's concerned, it was done 2,000 years ago. God is not saying, all right, I'll heal this one and not heal that one. There are people that receive and others that don't, but it's never God who determines who receives and who doesn't receive. And this is one of the points that I'm going to be making this morning as we go through this. Let me just start over here in Acts chapter 10 and in verse 39. This is Acts chapter 10, verse 39. Peter was speaking to Cornelius and preaching the gospel to him. And he kind of summarized Jesus' ministry um, or where is it? Verse 38, Acts chapter 10, verse 38. He summarized Jesus' ministry by saying how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Boy, there's a lot of things in this one verse and I'm not going to spend the whole time here, but I just want to point out how that Jesus was anointed and he went and healed all. In the Greek, that word means all. It means every single one. He healed them all and they were oppressed of the devil, not oppressed of God. 
So I'm saying some things that are really simple, but again, people have heard all of this other stuff. And if you don't get it dealt with, it'll hinder your faith in receiving from God. In an effort to explain why sometimes Christians pray for healing and they don't see it manifest, religion has come along and said, well, maybe it's not God's will to heal you. Maybe God is teaching you something through this sickness. And again, I could spend more than one hour on every one of these things I'm saying. I'm just summarizing a lot of things and I've got multitudes of teaching out there. All of our instructors have a lot of teaching that will go into the depth of this. So if I'm saying anything that, you know, uh, seems contrary to you, please go study it out. But there are people that in an effort to say uh, why a person isn't healed, they will come up with excuses and blame God for it. You know, I was with Oral Roberts just a couple of months before he died. Jamie and I were privileged to go to his house and we were with uh, some other pastors and uh, they asked him, uh, or everybody got to ask him for one thing that we could pray and he would lay hands on us and agree with us. And so when it came to me, I said, I want to see more people manifest healing. And I really believe that that prayer is answered through Daniel and Carly and through all of these people and the things that we're doing here. It's not just all happening through me, but it's all of the people that we've raised up. I was talking to Steve and Joanne Roast or Roust. Where are you? Roast. Anyway, I've known them for 40 years and I still don't know how to pronounce her name. <laughs> but I was talking to them and they are pastoring a church in McKinney, Texas. And they're talking about they're seeing miracles and they're seeing all of these things happening. And so we are seeing lots of miracles, but it's not always through me. It's through the people that we uh, minister to. But healing school started right after I got back from uh, having Oral Roberts pray for me. But anyway, my point is that when I asked him, I said, I want to see more miracles. He says, it won't work for you. <laughs> and I said, why won't it work for me? And he said, because you're a pastor. And I said, I'm not a pastor. And he said, oh, well then it'll work for you. <laughs> and he prayed with me. And some of you wonder, what does that mean? Why would he say, that? I can tell you exactly. I knew exactly what he was talking about. Because if you are a pastor and if you deal with the same group of people and you start teaching on healing, somebody's going to stand and believe and say, I'm believing God for healing and die. Mm -hmm. It happens. Yeah. Not because God didn't heal them, but because they didn't receive. Again, we're complicated and there's so many things going on. And when that happens, the average person will back off of what the word of God says and say, well, it couldn't have been that person's fault. It can't be my fault. It has to be that maybe God wanted them in heaven more than we needed them here. I was told that when my dad died, the pastor of the church told me that God needed your father in heaven more than you needed him. I was 12 years old and I was smart enough to know that that wasn't right. But see, they come up with excuses or maybe it's because, you know, you weren't believing. Well, that is one thing. And we will be talking about that. You do have to believe in order to receive. You doubt you do without. So unbelief is a problem and we will be talking about that. But that's not all that there is to it. You know, the unbelief of other people can affect you. Jesus had to put out all of the people who were mocking him and he kicked them out. Elijah, Elisha, both raised people from the dead. And in both places, they, both times they sought seclusion. When Peter raised Dorcas from the dead, he kicked out everybody else and sought seclusion. In the sixth chapter of the book of Mark, verse five, it says that Jesus could do no mighty work and he marveled because of their unbelief. If you put that together with Matthew 13, 58, which is the same story, it's just worded differently. It shows you the reason he couldn't do it was because of their unbelief. Jesus was operating in faith perfectly. There was zero limitation on Jesus, but the unbelief of people around him limited him. It didn't say he wouldn't do it. It said he couldn't do many mighty works because of their unbelief. So anyway, there's multiple things that affect things. And it's, it's just, it's a simplistic, um, easy way to just say, well, it was God that chose not to heal them. That's never the case. 
Well, it was their unbelief. Sometimes that's the case, but that's not the only reason. Sometimes people will say, well, it's sin. You've got a sin in your life. Jesus did say in John chapter five, when he ministered to the man at the pool of Bethesda, after he was healed, he says, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. So sin can be an inroad and it can hinder. If you're living in sin, stop it. <laughs> I'm not excusing sin. There could be multiple things, but anyway, if you are a pastor of a church, and this doesn't have to be true of all pastors. I know some pastors. We got Pastor Greg Moore here, and Greg didn't back off of the word just because he didn't see every single person manifest the healing. But it's harder when you're a pastor because sooner or later, you're going to see something that doesn't seem to line up with what you're believing. And the average person, rather than humble themselves and say, well, maybe... I was wrong. Maybe I've missed it. Maybe you've missed it. Maybe we don't understand everything or something. Instead, they will just, it's easy to blame God. Must have been God's will. You know, Jamie and I, when we started, we were ministering in Seagaville, Texas, and there was a woman there who had a little baby and she, she was an American, but they lived in Guatemala. And while they were in Guatemala, she had a child and she was a little tiny woman and she had a big baby and she delivered in the car on the way to the airport. And because of it, this child had all kinds of problems. And I know that this isn't correct, uh, politically correct today, but I don't know what else to call it. This is what she called it, that her child was retarded. And today I'm sure they have a different word for it, but there's no disrespect intended. That's just, I don't know what else to call it. This child wasn't normal. And one of the things that happened, it didn't have an immune system. Wow. And they told the people, they said, if, they, if this child ever gets a cold, it'll die because it doesn't have the ability to fight against it. And so anyway, the little boy Flint was four years old and he got a cold, called Jamie and me. We went to their house. I prayed with him for over two hours prayed in tongues. They said, they, of course, were in Guatemala and they said, I was speaking in tongues and saying, get up, run, walk. I was saying these things. I didn't know what I was saying. I was talking in tongues. And anyway, this child died. And for two hours, I prayed for this child to come back from the dead. And he didn't. And I called other people to agree. And we didn't see this child raised from the dead. And I can guarantee you there was pressure on me to try and comfort this family. And I, I felt like saying, well, God must have some other purpose. Maybe, you know, I, all of the things that I was told, I, I was tempted to tell them. But I told this couple, I said, look, God is not the one who did not heal your child. I said, I don't know what the problem is. I said, I've done as much as I know to do I'm going to have to accept that it's my fault. Maybe I'm just not strong enough in faith. Maybe I don't know. Maybe it's your fault. Maybe it's both of our fault. Maybe it's things that I don't know, but I can guarantee you it's God's will to heal every time. And I told him that, and that wasn't real comforting. Somebody else would have come along and said, well, God's ways are not our ways. They're higher than our thoughts. And so we know that God has a purpose in this and that's the way most people would respond. But I just had to tell them the truth. I said, it's my fault. It's your fault. It's both of our faults. It's something else, but it's not God. God's not the one who did this. And anyway, at the funeral, I did the funeral, first funeral I'd ever done. And it was pitiful. I didn't know what to say. And we were just all grieving. But because I told them the truth, did you know, I forget exactly what period of time. It was months, I guess. And this woman finally came to me and she says, you know what, when he was born, they told me he didn't have an immune system. They've been telling me their, his whole life that if he ever got a cold, he would die. And she says, I just believe that. I was operating in so much fear. And when I saw him, she says, I understand now that I just wasn't standing in faith. The negative things that were spoken were stronger to me than the um, positive things that the word of God says. And so she repented and says, I believe that that's the thing that caused this. And because she was so small and because she had these problems when she gave birth, they told her to never have another child. And if she had a child, they would have to take it by cesarean and the chances of her living would be small. And so they just told her not to do it. But because I told her the truth and because we didn't sit here and blame God in an effort to make us look good, 
Did you know that that woman had what? Four or five more children and had them all natural childbirth at home. And when they all graduated from college, she sent me a picture of each one of them in their um, garb with their hats on saying, thank you for telling me the truth. Amen. Praise God. So I got off on all of that by saying that they were oppressed of the devil, not of God. God is not putting sickness on you. God has not done something to you as punishment for your sins. Again, there can be a linkage between sickness and sin, as Jesus said in John chapter five, go sin no more lest the worst thing has come upon you. But it's not because God put it on you. You know, over in the book of Galatians chapter six, it says, if you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption, not of God reap corruption, but of the flesh. There are natural things going on. And if like say, for instance, if you go out and if you're 200, 300 pounds overweight, that gives place to such things as sugar diabetes, high blood pressure, back pain and other things. But it's not God that's punishing you and he's not going to heal you because you're overweight. Man, if that was true, not very many people would be getting healed. Praise God. So it's not God that's punishing you and it's not God who won't take the sickness away, but there are natural things. And if you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. If you're living in adultery, if you're living homosexuality, those things are hindrances for God's power flowing through you. But God loves you. He loves adulterers. He loves homosexuals. He will heal you even in your sin if you will humble yourself and receive it. But for you to just harden your heart and rebel against God and say, God, I know you told me to go this way, but I will go this way regardless of what you say. And I'd like to be healed as I go serve the devil. That's a hindrance. You need to stop that. Amen. So you, as much as you can, you need to be living for God. But notice it says that they were oppressed of the devil and Jesus healed every one. Every one of them. That's important. I want you to understand it's God's will for every one of us to be healed. You know, I, I put these things in my footnote and I'm going to, uh, if you haven't got my living commentary, you're missing a blessing. I've written footnotes on over 26,000 verses in the Bible and uh, it's just awesome. I want to share these verses with you. Jesus said this in John chapter five, verse 30. This is right after he healed that man at the pool of Bethesda. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the father, which has sent me. Some people have tried to use this to say that Jesus was less than God. He couldn't do anything by himself. It's just the opposite. Jesus was expressing his oneness with God. He was so one with God. He couldn't operate independent, independent of him. Jesus, even though he was God manifest in the flesh, would not operate independent of his father. He wouldn't do anything of himself. John chapter eight, verse 28 says, then said Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the son of man, then shall you know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself. But as my father hath taught me, I speak these things. Again, expressing that total dependency. He never said anything that was contrary to God. John 12, 49, for I have not spoken of myself, but the father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Jesus was claiming divine God, the father inspiration for everything he said and did. John chapter 14, verse 10, believest thou not that I am in the father and the father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. The reason I was reading that is to establish that Jesus represented God the father perfectly. He didn't operate independent of him. As a matter of fact, over in Hebrews uh, chapter one, verse three, it says that Jesus is the express image of the father. And if you look that word up, the express image means a perfect representation not a similar rep representation, 
but perfect. Jesus even said this in John chapter 14 when he was talking to Philip. He says, have you been so long time with you and you don't know me? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus was a perfect representation of the Father. So the reason that's important is because how did Jesus respond to the sick? If he is a perfect representation of the Father, show me an instance where Jesus put sickness on a person to teach them something or to humble them or to make them a better person. It doesn't exist. Show me an instance where Jesus ever said, no, you haven't learned your lesson yet. I'm not going to heal you yet. It's not time. Show me an instance where anybody ever came to Jesus and he says, you have to suffer a little bit more. I'll heal you later. There is no such thing. If he did only what he saw his father do, and if he was a perfect representation of his father, so that if you've seen him, you've seen the father, well, then all of these things that religion teaches that, well, sometimes God gives you sickness. Sometimes God will say no. That's an answer to prayer. Sometimes he'll say no. God never says no to something that he's already paid for. Second Corinthians chapter one, verse 20 says, all of the promises of God in him are yea and amen. Yes and amen under the glory of God the Father by us. God is not saying no to a single person. I don't care if the doctors have said it's incurable. God is not saying no to anybody. He's already healed every single person. He never says no to anybody. He never did it. Look at what the Bible says that Jesus did. And these are just a very few verses. I could probably uh, triple. I just picked out a few that make this very clear. Matthew chapter four, verse 23. It says, and Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people, all. I've had people come to me before and say, well, I know that the Bible says that he healed blindness and he healed deafness and he healed this, but can he heal cancer? Can he heal AIDS? It says all manner of sickness, all manner of disease. You put this together with Deuteronomy chapter 28, where it lists the blessings that came by keeping the law and then the curses that came if you didn't keep it. And of course we're redeemed from those curses. So anything that was stated as a curse has now become a blessing through Jesus. Well, you can turn it around. And one of the things it says there in Matthew chapter 28, I believe it's around verse 66, 68, someplace in there. It says, and all sickness and all diseases, which are not written in the book of the law, them will the Lord bring upon you until you're destroyed. Again, we've been redeemed from that. So you can say we are redeemed from all sickness and all diseases that are not written in the book of the law. You don't have to have a scripture that says God heals multiple sclerosis. God heals muscular dystrophy. God heals Lyme disease. Man, all sickness, all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And in verse 24, it says, and his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments and those which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic and those that had the palsy and he healed them. They brought unto him all sick people and he healed them. It didn't say he healed some but others he didn't heal. He healed them. Matthew chapter eight, verse 16. This is after Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law who had a fever and he rebuked the fever. I could spend an hour on that. But most people are thinking that sickness and disease is all physical. There are some things that are physical. You know, I cut myself yesterday and I had to put a Band-Aid on it because again, this morning it was bleeding and that's just physical. This isn't demonic that I bled. (laughs) This is just something physical. And so anyway, I cut my finger and I put a little bandaid on. There's some things that are physical. You hit your thumb with a hammer and that's not the devil. (laughs) That's just natural. So there are some things that are natural and organic, but I, and there, are, again, I've got another footnote on this. I'm doing this by memory, but I think there was 10 times 
separate times in the gospels that I've isolated that Jesus cast demons out of people to effect cures. Some of those things were curvature of the spine, a woman that was totally bent over, one that had an issue of blood, demonic uh, blindness, deafness. Uh, there's a number of things. That doesn't mean that every person with curvature of the spine is demonic, but sometimes it is at least because he did it. Sometimes those other things. And I think one of the mistakes that people make, they just are looking for physical reasons. You know, to a large degree, Christians have become humanistic. And most Christians would say, oh no, not me. But we look for a physical answer for everything. We think that everything is just physical. And if we could just get the right minerals, if we could take holistic things, if we could do this, everything would be fixed. Again, there's some truth to that, that if all you do is lay on a couch, if you never move and you eat bonbons all day, and you grow to be a thousand pounds, you got a physical problem. But it's probably inspired by some demonic thing that you would do that. Anyway, we're looking for a physical answer and sometimes that's the reason the doctors can't find out what's wrong with you because it's not physical, it's demonic. Sometimes you need to cast demons out of people in order to see them healed. Matter of fact, Oral Roberts, when we were with him, he said that the greatest miracles he ever saw were when he cast demons out. Other times, you know, the Bible, there's different ways that you can receive healing. You lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In other words, the problem ends right then and their body just begins to recover. And that's a valid way of healing. But sometimes when demons are cast out, Instantly that person is set free because it wasn't natural. It wasn't physical. It was demonic. And the moment that Satan's power is broken, you see a total manifestation. Man, those are awesome things. So again, Matthew chapter eight, he had just healed Peter's mother-in-law, rebuked the fever. And it says, and when even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, Matthew eight sixteen, And he cast out the spirits with his word, Here again, see, is affecting healing by casting out spirits and healed all that were sick. All that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. This is referring back to Isaiah chapter 53, verses four and five, where it says, surely he hath borne our sorrows and carried our griefs, but we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, but he bore our sicknesses and diseases and by his stripes we were healed. Many, I was raised in a church that they acknowledged that Isaiah 53 talked about that by his stripes we are healed. But instead of applying that physically, they applied it spiritually. This is talking about healed emotionally. We're healed. We were like cripples emotionally and walking through life and they would spiritualize it. But here is the commentary on that. And when he was healing people and he healed them all, it says that this was the fulfillment of the prophecy spoken by Isaiah. And if you actually went over to Isaiah 53 and looked at those words in the Hebrew, it literally means infirmities and diseases. And that's what this is saying. So the Bible comments on itself. If you'll read the Bible commentary, you'll get the true meaning. And he said, this is the fulfillment of that spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. Jesus bore our physical sicknesses and he does not want you sick. The next one is in Matthew 9, 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease. Is there any sickness or any disease that God does not heal? No, every sickness, every disease. I've had many people come to me and say, but the doctors say this is incurable. Who cares? It's only incurable if that's what you believe. And brothers and sisters, I'm saying this in love, but this is why so many people don't see the manifestation is because you value the word of the doctor more than you value the word of God. And when the doctor says it's incurable and sends you home to die, you just say, well, there's no hope. 
There may not be any hope in the natural, but man, Jesus healed every sickness and every disease. And I want to tell you, regardless of what you're dealing with, Jesus has already dealt with it. It's no big deal to him. Jesus isn't struggling and saying, Andrew, don't tell them this, man, these people in the wheelchairs, I don't know if I could pull this off. Don't be so bold. <laughs> Lower their expectation. I'm telling you, Jesus has already healed every one of you. He's already done his part. It's not God who's having a problem. And one of the problems is that we are so plugged into this world that we listen to them and we look at what other people do instead of looking to the word of God. I'm trying to point you back that this is Jesus who was the express image of the father who did only what he saw his father do and he healed them all, every single one of them. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 15, it says, but when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all. What part of all do we not understand? Again, people say, but that's not what I see. Well, that's because you aren't looking in the word. Faith comes through the word. Faith doesn't come by listening to the evening news and the 10 spies network and stuff like this. You've got to get focused on what the word of God says. In Matthew 14, 14, and Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion towards them and he healed their sick. You know, this is another thing that again, we could spend an entire hour talking about this but God loves you. He was moved with compassion. He loves you. He is not pleased. It says in Psalms 35, 27, um, yea, let all those who favor my righteous cause say continually, let God be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And this isn't only talking about physical prosperity. It's talking about Phys emotional um, healing, all of these things. God is pleased when you're well. God didn't create you for sickness. He created you to be well. God isn't getting any pleasure out of you being sick. It grieves him. It grieves him as much as anything else. He created you to be whole. You know, a verse I've been meditating on and I just want to skip over there. I think it's Exodus chapter 23 Verse 25, if they could put that verse up so I don't have to turn over there. Exodus 23, 25. I hope that's the right one. That's it. And you shall serve the Lord your God and he shall bless thy bread and thy water. And I, talking about he, if you take it in context, the he is talking about this angel that he would send with them and he would bless thy bread and thy water. And I, God, will take sickness away from the midst of thee. Did you know the word for take and away is the exact same word. It's used twice before the word sickness. And that word take literally means to turn off. I will turn off sickness, turn off from the midst of these, what it, what it literally says. And you know, I was meditating on this and Jesus bore our sicknesses on the cross but before the cross, when he took sin upon himself, Jesus wasn't ever sick. There's no indication of it. I don't even believe that he could have been sick because there wasn't any receptors in him for sickness. Sin can cause sickness, but even if it's not an individual sin, it's the sin of the world in general that causes all sickness. It's a fallen world. Somehow or another, the sin, the corruption that's in the world, viruses, germs, original, in the original creation, they weren't destructive. Just like weeds and things like that. In the, you know, animals, they were all herb, herbivorous, I think is the way you say that, before the fall, and then they tar, turned car, carnivorous. But that's a reaction to the fall. Originally, God made it so that there was no such thing as bacteria or virus that were damaging. If they were here, they all did something good. And before sin entered, before sin entered into Jesus, there was no receptors in him. 
You know, this woman, Caroline Leaf, a uh, doctor who's written a book about who switched off my brain. I've not read the book, but I've had people tell me about it and give me chapters and I've read portions of it. And in a, in a summary, basically what she's saying that there is every cell in your body has like a combination on it that things can't enter into that cell if it's healthy. But then she talks about toxic thoughts that your mind, the way you think communicates with every cell in your body every day. And if you have toxic thoughts, thoughts of fear, if you've lost hope, if you're depressed, if you're defeated, if you're discouraged, if you're bitter, unforgiveness, and all of these toxic thoughts, it like it undoes the combination to your cells and it allows your cells to become cancerous and become sick and become diseased. In other words, it's still a result of sin. Maybe not an individual sin, but just the sin that's in this human race. And I believe that before Jesus died on the cross, he was God manifest in the flesh. He had a physical body, but it was perfect. And it was immune to sickness, the way that God made us originally to be. And so when I look at that and it says he t uh, turns off sickness, I believe that Jesus literally couldn't get sick. If a germ touched his body, it wouldn't have any effect because there was nothing receptive to sin and sickness and disease in him. And did you know we have promises that that same thing is for us? Amen. Psalms chapter 91, verse 10, I believe it is. No plague will come nigh our dwelling. Only with our eyes will we see and behold the reward of the wicked. A thousand will fall at our side and 10,000 at our right hand, but it shall not come nigh me. You know what that is? That's saying you can turn off sickness. You can literally get to a place to where you don't get sick. I don't get sick. I don't believe in getting sick. And you know, when all this COVID stuff happened, I've spoken boldly about this and we've been trashed and criticized in the local paper. And I've got uh, Lamont and Sharon Rich who go out and visit pastors. And, and he went to visit one of the pastors here in Woodland Park and told him who he was representing. And the guy said, that's a guy that believes no germ can touch him and live. And he immediately just shut the door. I don't want to talk to you. This guy's crazy. Take it up with God. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says you can get to where no sickness will come nigh your dwelling. It does have a little uh, condition on that. If you read Psalms chapter 91, verse one, it says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. You have to dwell there. You can't visit there. You can't have a little 30 minute devotion during the day and then the rest of the day operate in total unbelief and doubt and bitterness and anger. And then the next morning you go back and visit. No, you have to dwell in the shadow of the almighty. And then verse two says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. There's a lot of people that they know those verses, but you couldn't force them to say, I will not get sick because they would man, that's a little arrogant. What, you don't know what's going to happen. Well, that's what you believe. I believe I don't get sick. And because of it, I don't get sick. And you're saying, well, I don't believe that. Well, believe, get sick. You're welcome to it. God loves you. You don't have to be healed to go to heaven. As a matter of fact, you can get there quicker if you aren't healed. And God loves you, so I, I love you. I'm not mad at you, but I'm just saying, I, I believe God's turned off sickness on the inside of me. I don't get sick. I don't believe in getting sick. I can't remember the last time I've been sick. I've had sickness twice in 53 years. And it was because one time I ministered 40 times in one week and the next week I ministered 41 times and I was so tired, I literally crawled to bed and laid in bed for 24 hours. And when I got up, I felt better and I went out and split a cord of wood and I got a cold and had a sinus headache. That was one time. And the other time I came back from England, had been awake for 70 something hours without any sleep. My 
pond was plugged up and in the winter I broke the ice and got under the ice cold water to unplug my drain after not sleeping for 70 hours and I got a cold. And those are the only two things I've dealt with in 53 years and that's stupidity, that's not sickness. <laughs> Matthew chapter 14 verse 34 says, and when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret and when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all the country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment and as many as touched were made perfectly whole. If Jesus is the express image of the father, if he only did what he saw his father do, then we can say that he never made any person sick. He never refused to heal a person. He never told a person that you're going to get healed later because you haven't learned your lesson yet. He never told a person that, well, I just want this to be a gradual healing. There are two times I can show you that there was a gradual healing, but in both places, that's because of the way the people received it. And there's nothing wrong with that. None of us are perfect. And we're all in different stages of growth. And so come and we'll lay hands on you and you shall recover. And if it takes a day, a week, a month, praise God, there's no bad way to get healed. But God's not the one that determines that it takes time to be healed. We're the ones that determine that. So we can tell by what he didn't do that a lot of the stuff that people are thinking, probably people that came to this uh, meeting have been taught some of these things. And if you think those things, think Satan will use those thoughts, those wrong attitudes to hinder you in receiving your healing. So that's on the negative side. He never did those things. But on the positive side, I gave you all of these examples where he healed every single person. There are 47 times in the gospel where Jesus healed every single person. There's 16 more times that he healed people by casting demons out of people. There's 60 something times that Jesus healed people. There's more healing in the Bible than there is teaching on prosperity, than there is teaching on salvation. There's more uh, teaching about healing than there was about heaven and hell. And all of those things are true and all of those things exist. But most people have just let this world dominate them and they are influenced by all of the negative stuff that they've heard. You know, I'm quitting here quickly, but I had a situation where um, I had a woman who had been like a spiritual mother to me and she was believing in the sovereignty of God, which I believe God is sovereign if you use it the way the dictionary says that he's in control as far as he's the head. Nothing happens. Uh, he, nobody makes him do anything. But if you use sovereign to say that God controls everything, that is wrong. And if you believe that, it'll stop you from being healed because you believe it's up to God whether you get healed. Yeah. I'm showing you, God's already done his part. It's up to you whether you get healed. Not based on your goodness and holiness, but your determination. You've got to believe and stand. And anyway, this woman was trying to push this sovereignty of God and I stood up to her and I said, no, that's not right. And boy, she got upset and she began to counter me and I refused to back down. And anyway, Jamie was there. My mother was there. My sister was there. And after this woman left, they all jumped on me like a chicken on a June bug <laughs> saying that you shouldn't have talked to Mrs. Smith that way. How dare you? And I got condemned. And I got the feeling like, oh God, I was wrong. I didn't mean to be. I was just trying to defend what I saw in the word against what I saw was there. And I, I didn't intend for it to be malicious, but that's the way they felt like it came out. And so I got condemned and our one-year-old, I think he was just under one-year-old at that time, he got sick. And he had, I don't know what it was. We didn't take him to the doctor. We didn't have a thermometer. We didn't take his temperature, but for three days, a uh, kid that was over uh, less than one year old didn't move and didn't eat and do, didn't do anything for three days and had a high fever. You could touch him and he was hot. And man, I was praying and believing with all I was worth and it wasn't getting better and I was beginning to panic. And uh, my associate came over. He sat on our stereo and he just jumped on me. And he says, you know, you can preach it but you can't live it. 
It says, you preach that God loves us and it's not based on our performance, but you're condemned. You feel like you deserve this because you uh, responded to this lady that way. And he just jumped on my case and he says, you know, you're a hypocrite. And he started telling me these things. And, and anyway, when he left, his wife jumped on his case and says, how dare you speak to Andrew that way? So he turned around and by the time he got back 10 minutes, he came back to apologize. Joshua was already healed because it was true. I was limiting God, thinking, God, I deserve this. This must be your punishment upon me. And that, th that thinking was hindering my faith from producing the healing. I felt like I was getting what I deserved. And when he said those things to me, I recognized it as truth. I went in and took my authority and boom, like that, Joshua got healed. And there's some of you that you know what the word says and you believe if I pray, it's going to work or, or Daniel or Carly or somebody else, but you feel condemned. You feel unworthy. You feel like you are deserving this. God, I haven't done all of these things. That kind of thinking is what's hindering you. It's not God. God wants you well. God wants you healed. God brought you to this place to get you well. And we're going to be praying for you. We will pray with you every single time. We've got our prayer ministers up here before and after every service. We'll pray with you until we rub all the hair off your head. But we are going to pray and we are going to see you manifest your healing. God wants you well. Amen. Praise the Lord. So Father, I just thank you for these truths. I thank you. I know that these things are true. I thank you that they're working in my life. And I just share these things with my brothers and sisters to encourage them to believe and to receive. And we thank you in advance that we are going to see great and mighty miracles happen this week. For more of Andrew's teaching and other resources, please visit our website at awmi.net. Or for prayer and additional information, call our helpline at 719-635-1111. Again, that's 719-635-1111.